All right, hello students. This is Mrs. Ignacio. This recording is for PNR 104, and we're talking about chapter 18, safely lifting, moving, and positioning patients. Follow along also in your textbook on page 272. That would not be a bad idea. Okay, so for chapter 18, we're talking about the anatomy and the function of the musculoskeletal system. So not only the skeletal system are bones, but also the muscles working together with the skeleton. We'll also talk about the importance of proper body mechanics, alignment, and position change for both patient and nurse. We'll discuss the principles of safe body movement and positioning and give an appropriate example for each principle. We're also going to identify ways to maintain the pa patient's body alignment in the bed or chair. So just remember that the body is made up of bones, 206 bones to be exact. And we have four types of bones. The bones can be short, long, flat, or irregular. And uh, it's important to kind of understand how the skeleton is set up, right? And understand that joints is where two bones meet and the joints usually move freely. Now, in the case of the skull, that's one uh, place that the joints do not move freely. You don't want the joints to move freely in your adult uh, because the, the bones of the skull uh, will protect the brain, okay? And so when we think about the bones of the skull, they are immovable joints that are called sutures, sutures, okay? But those are immovable joints. Now, bursa are small sacs, they're fluid-filled sacs that provide cushion at friction points in freely movable joints. Okay, so if a patient has bursitis, there's an inflammation of the bursa. When we think about the muscles, remember there's three types of muscles. There's skeletal muscle, there's cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. So cardiac muscle is found in the heart, Smooth muscle is found in, the, in our organs, but skeletal muscle is connected to bones. And skeletal muscle is connected to bones uh, via tendons. And these skeletal muscles are striated, so they have lines or stripes. And these striated muscles, skeletal muscle, they're surrounded by a connective tissue teeth, not sheath, rather. Okay, the tendons themselves, they're fibrous, tough fibrous tissue that connects that skeletal muscle to the bones. Ligaments connect bones to bones, okay? So when we think about ligaments, um, it's going to connect our bones to bones or bones to cartilage, okay? So ligaments connect bones to bones or bones to cartilage, but tendons connect muscles to bones. Now, you may be wondering, okay, well, what's cartilage? Cartilage is a fibrous connective tissue that acts as a cushion. So we have cartilage in our knees, that's an example. So if a patient's cartilage in their knees is worn out, they may have something that's called crepitation. It might sound like grinding because their two bones are actually uh, rubbing together as they walk. Okay, so let's talk about the functions of bones. What are the job of bones? Well, bones provide the body with support. Bones are also giving the body shape. Bones protect the internal organs. The ribs protect the, the heart and the lungs. The skull protects the brain. So the bones also are places where ligaments and tendons attach. The bones also serve as a storage for calcium and for phosphorus. But the big thing that we think about is calcium. Okay, so really important jobs of the, the bones. Uh, the bones also serve the inside part of the bone, particularly the bone marrow. That's where red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are made inside the red marrow of the bone. Let's talk about the functions of muscles. Well, muscles can stretch and they can be stimulated to contract and or extend, 
okay? And so the muscles help to provide movement, they stabilize the joints and they produce heat and they help us to maintain our posture. <coughs> Excuse me, so we could not move or locomote or move from point A to point B without the skeleton and the muscles working together. You may be wondering what kind of changes occur with aging for bones and muscles. If you go to your textbook on page 273, you're going to see that bone mass can lead to osteoporosis in women. And it's usually found in women, especially postmenopausal women. So also we have a loss as the patient ages of bone density and that predisposes your geriatric patient to fractures or breaking of the bone. Muscle cells are also lost and replaced by fat cells as the patient ages. Also elasticity of muscle fiber is decreased. So as we age, we become less flexible. Joint motion, <clears throat> excuse me, may decrease, limiting motion and mobility as our patient ages. So one of the things you want to think about is, and this is a QSEM consideration on page 273, it's the orange box. It says the older adult has an increased risk of falls related to sarcopenia and diminished balance. So the the elderly patient also has decreased visual acuity, hearing loss, and decreased sensations, decreased risk for pressure ulcers. So these are all things that we should know about our geriatric patient. You may be uh, wondering, okay, what is sarcopenia? Sarcopenia is age-related muscle loss, okay? Sarcopenia is age-related muscle loss. And you always have to understand the considerations for your geriatric patient. Let's go to our textbook on page 274, where it tells us about principles of body movement for nurses. So we don't want to get hurt as we're helping our patients. We don't want to become the patient. And so one of the most common injuries that nurses nurses face is going to be back strain, particularly lower back strain. So whenever possible, get help. In the NFLEX world, we're not short staffed. We have plenty of people. So always get help to move a patient, to lift a patient, or to position a patient. So always get help. You want to use your thigh, arm, or leg muscles rather than your back muscles. And you always want to have a wide base of support. So keep your feet shoulder width apart. And you really want to tighten your abdominal muscles. If you're moving something, keep it close to your body, not far away from your body. On page 274, there's box 18.1, and it gives you the guidelines for moving and lifting uh, body mechanics. So make sure that you take a look at that table. That's going to be really important. So again, we're keeping our feet shoulder width apart. We're going to use the greatest number of muscles and preserving our back. Keep the loads close to the body uh, near your center of gravity and pull and pivot. You want to use smooth movements, coordinated movements. You don't want to jerk anything because that can actually cause injury to yourself and to your patients. So again, use leg muscles to prevent back strain. Also, you want to keep your elbows close and uh, to your body and always move the bed to a good working height. That's going to be important. Now, understand that pulling actions require less effort than pushing. So you want to face the direction of the movement. Use your arms as levers when you're pulling the patient towards you. Lock the elbows and rock back on your heels. Use the weight of your body to help move the patient. Now, when you are moving your patient, you want to protect them. And we're going to have two basic principles to protect our patient. And that is maintain correct anatomic position. So you may be remembering in anatomy and physiology, you learned about the anatomical position. 
I like to think of it as mountain pose if you do yoga. So the patient is standing, facing forward, the toes are pointing forward, the arms are extended at the sides, and the palms are visible. And um, the head is looking, the, the head is pointing straight ahead, the eyes are looking straight ahead. That is the anatomic position. So you want to maintain that position when uh, to maintain the patient's proper body alignment and positioning. You also want to change the patient's position frequently. The standard is every two hours. So every two hours, we, if it's a bedbound patient, of course, and an immobilized patient, we change their position every two hours because we're concerned about pressure ulcers, right? So what if we don't align our patient, uh, keep them in alignment with the anatomical position? What if we don't reposition them every two hours? Well, they can end up with pressure ulcers. They can end up with contractures, muscle cramps, and they can end up with fluid collection in their lungs, okay? So that is not desirable. So in this picture, in figure 18.2, in your textbook on page 274, you're going to see, again, that proper alignment. So in this picture, the palms are not facing forward, but the arms are extended and at the patient's side. Okay, and so this is correct body alignment. The back is straight, the arms are relaxed, the feet are forward, the toes are uh, pointing forward, the toes are forward. So again, this is going to be a correct body alignment. So sitting alignment is figure 18.5. Uh, 18.5 is in your textbook on page 276. And this is the correct sitting body alignment. And so it's not just good for our patients, it's also good for us as a reminder. All right, let's jump into pressure ulcers. Pressure ulcers can be known as decubitus ulcers, decubitus ulcers. Uh, when we think about these decubitus ulcers or bed sores, we don't want our patients to get these bed sores. And so what happens if a patient is laying on a bony prominence, they're not changed, uh, their position is not changed every two hours, uh, if they have poor nutrition, they run the risk of developing these pressure ulcers. So this is a complication that we definitely don't want to have happen to our patients. So we have to really uh, pad bony prominences. And when we say bony prominences, that's where the bone is sticking out, okay? Also, something else that can cause pressure ulcers or damage to our patient's skin is a downward shearing force. So we have to always use uh, pressure relieving devices, but we also want to use um, assistive devices like a draw sheet that will minimize the, the shear and friction that our patient will face because that shearing force can actually cause pressure ulcer or can even tear the skin. Okay, that's important to note. So let's apply the nursing process, okay? So we think add pie and assess. We assess the patient when they are standing, looking for proper alignment, looking at their head in relation to the rest of the body. When they're sitting, we're looking for symmetry or they slumped over to one side. If the patient is lying down, we want to make sure that we're assessing for body alignment and correct positioning. And when the patient is walking or ambulating, we're looking at the patient. Are they able to walk effectively? Are they limping? Are they favoring one side? These are all important parts of our patient assessment. Now, the next step in ADPI is going to be diagnosis. We're identifying any issues the patient may have. So they may be at risk for injury. They may have altered mobility. They may also have altered skin integrity. So these are the nursing diagnosis. And we have to always prioritize our nursing diagnosis using the ABCs, using Maslow's hierarchy. Okay, so now that we've discussed the assessment and diagnosis piece, let's look at planning. What are we going to do for our patient? So we're going to say, okay, what can we delegate to our care partner or our unlicensed assistant personnel, 
We also have to think about what's happening in a home setting because of the families going to be caring for the patient. So we have to think about that as well. When our patient goes home, <coughs> who's going to be caring for them? Excuse me. And, um, you know, what's going to be safe? So we want to make sure that we emphasize that and put that as part of our plan. So when we think about the expected outcomes of our planning, we want the patient to not have any musculoskeletal injury. We want the patient to resume their normal level of, mo of, of mobility, whatever they had before they came to see us. Uh, we want the patient to have uh, maintain their skin integrity because remember the skin is the first line of defense against injury and infection. We also want the patient not to experience any injury while they're ambulating. We want the patient to have full range of motion, uh, active range of motion. The patient can move on their own or passive range of motion. We will do for them and that's going to help to protect uh, prevent contractures. And we really need to do these passive range of motion uh, several times a day. Okay, so here's a question for you. When moving a patient, it is proper to use, uh, it's important to use proper body mechanics. Which of the following is not a proper body mechanic? Okay, so I want you to think which of the following is not a proper body mechanic. Okay, so using your leg muscles, keeping your feet together to provide stability for movement, using smooth coordinated movements instead of jerking or sudden movements, keeping loads as well as your elbows close to the body, okay? So which one is not a proper body mechanic? So this is a negative question. So we're looking for the thing that we should not do. And if you said choice number two, you are correct. We don't want to keep the feet together. We want to keep the feet shoulder width apart. Keeping the feet shoulder width apart provides a wide base of support and provides stability for movement. All right, let's look at question number two. Okay, so Leanne is teaching her patient's husband how to lift his wife safely. Which of the following is true regarding lifting the elderly? As the body ages, there's no change in posture. There is usually an increase in muscle mass as we age. Whatever items that could be lifted in your youth should be lifted in later years. Joint motion may decrease limiting mobility. So which of the following is true uh, regarding lifting the elderly? Okay, so we're looking for what is something that is true. This is a positive question. So take a moment to think about which one is true or which set of uh, information is correct. So four is the correct choice. Joint motion may decrease limiting mobility because as we age, there could, there is a change in posture. And as we age, we have a decrease in muscle mass. That's your sar sarcopenia. And let me just make sure that I'm saying that word correctly. Yes, sarcopenia. And whatever items could be lifted in your youth should be lifted in later years. Well, that's not true because you have a loss of muscle mass. So you're not as strong as you used to be as in, in the days of your youth. Okay. All right. So those are our two questions. Let's go to the second part of this chapter. So we're going to describe the proper method for transferring a patient between a wheelchair and bed. So in a clinical setting, in a lab setting, you're going to position the patient in the supine, prone, fowler, and sims position. You'll assist patients to sit up in bed. 
You'll demonstrate range of motion. You'll transfer patients from wheelchair to bed and from a bed to a stretcher. And you'll also demonstrate correct techniques for ambulating a patient and breaking a fall. So this is something that uh, we kind of did uh, with the group on Thursday night. And I know that Mrs. Holland is going over this with you as far as ambulating the patient and transferring the patient. Okay, so let's, uh, you know, ground ourselves in the nursing process. That's always a good thing to do. Um, and so now we're looking at implementation. We already looked at the assessment, the nursing diagnosis, the planning. Now we're going to actually do some things for our patient. So when we position our patient, we are accomplishing four objectives. We're number one, providing comfort for the patient, and we want the patient to be comfortable. We also are removing any pressure on those bony prominences or any other parts that have constant, constant pressure because we want to decrease the risk of the patient developing these bed sores, these pressure ulcers, or the cubitus ulcers. Okay, they're all the same, but just different names. Bed sores, pressure ulcers, the cubitus ulcers. We also want to prevent contractures and any deformities and respiratory problems in our patient. So we want to prevent complications of immobility. So that's why positioning is so important. We also want to improve circulation. We want our patients' cells and tissues to have adequate blood flow because we know that blood brings oxygen and nutrients and blood takes away the waste products as well. So in your textbook, you're going to see the different positions and their variations. And that's something that you should definitely take a look at. On page 278 in your textbook, you will start to see the different positions uh, that you can place your patients in, okay? So we have dorsal recumbent, lithotomy, the knee to chest position. Uh, we have the supine position where the patient is laying on their back. And if you start on page uh, two, 278, you go to 279, 280, you'll see these various positions go all the way to 282. Now, the patient that is lying supine and lying on their back, if the patient is having the head of the bed, that's what HOB means, head of the bed, elevated, that means the head of the bed is raised 60 to 90 degrees, that is going to be the Fowler's position. If it's a little bit less than that, it's 30 to 60 degrees, that is the patient in the semi-fowler's position. Notice the fowler's position and semi-fowler's, the patient is supine. That means they're laying on their back, but the head of the bed is elevated, okay? Now, low fowler's position, the patient is still supine, but the head of the bed is only elevated 15 to 30 degrees, okay? So it's important to know these different positions, and again, that these positions are found in your textbook on page 279, 280, you'll see, all the way to 282, okay? So here's some pictures of the semi-fowler's position and the fowler position. We usually don't keep our patients in the fowler's position, especially the high fowler's, which is 90 degrees, because that puts a lot of stress on their sacrum, which we don't want to do. Well, you may be wondering, why would I put my patient in a, the high fowler's position? Feeding, especially if they're at risk for aspiration, right, for choking. Also, if they're in respiratory distress, we'll put them in that high fowler's position. Okay, let's now look at the dorsal recumbent position. Okay, the dorsal recumbent position. That is on page 278, figure 18.6. So dorsal recumbent position. So the patient is supine, means they're laying on their back and their knees are flexed and their feet are flat on the bed. And so this is a position that is used for many procedures or examinations. This is a procedure that also can help if the patient has lower back pain. The dorsal lithotomy position is also on page 278 of your textbook. It is figure 18.7. 
Now, the lithotomy position is the position where the patient is lying supine, they're on their back, and their feet are in stirrups, and their legs are spread further apart. This is a position that is used in pelvic exams when it's time for your well-woman exams. So here is a picture that shows you figure 18.6, the dorsal recumbent position. And then figure 18.7 shows the lithotomy position, okay? The lithotomy position. Notice we keep the patient covered until it's time for the, the healthcare provider to work on uh, the patient because we want to protect their modesty and their dignity. So we also have other positions. We have the side lying lateral. And so that can be found in your textbook as well on page 280. So this side lying lateral has the patient lying on their side and it takes the, the pressure off of those bony prominences of the back. There's also the oblique side lying position. And this is good because it removes pressure from the shoulder and hip, and it's easier for patients. We also have the Sims position, and this is a variation of side lying. And this Sims position is used for rectal examinations or insertion of tubes or suppositories. So if I'm going to administer an enema on, for my patient, they are going to be in the left lateral Sims position. Left lateral Sims position. And the reason why is I need to have their buttocks exposed so I can get to their anus to administer the enema. So here's uh, the figure on the side lying positions, you see, and also to keep proper body alignment, we can put a pillow between the knees of the patient. Also, a pillow can be used uh, to keep the patient's back in proper position as well, in that side-lying oblique position. Here's the Sims position. Uh, again, for uh, administration of enemas, we will use the left lateral Sims position. Okay, let's talk about the prone position. That's found in your textbook on page 281. The patient is lying face down. And this is often used for patients with spinal cord injury. And it's generally not well tolerated. So you're not gonna go to the hospital and see patients, every patient in the prone position. It's specific kinds of patients. During uh, COVID, they did place patients in the prone position as a last resort to try to help them with their ventilation or their breathing. So that is the prone position. Uh, sometimes the patient can be placed in the knee chest position and that is found in your textbook on page 278 figure 18.8 that knee chest position and their face down this is going to be used for rectal examinations okay so here we have the figure showing the prone position and again that's in your textbook on page 281 then we have the knee chest position as figure 18.8, and that's in your textbook on page 278. Okay, so positioning devices, these are things that we use to help keep the patient in a particular position. We can use pillows to support the body or the extremities, extremities being the arms or the legs. We can use boots or splints, and that's gonna be important to prevent foot drop, okay? Because we want to maintain dorsiflexion and not have extension. Because if we have dorsi uh, extension, now we have what I call ballerina toes, and that is foot drop. And if the patient uh, gets foot drop, this is irreversible, and this is going to affect the patient's ability to ambulate. So, Another thing that we can use to prevent a patient from getting foot drop and to maintain their dorsiflexion is going to be high top sneakers or footboards. Those are going to be important to maintain dorsiflexion, prevent the patient from getting foot drop. We can also use trochanter rolls 
Trochanter rolls are important to prevent external rotation of the legs. Okay, so trochanter rolls will prevent external rotation of the legs. Okay, all right. Sandbags can also be used to immobilize an extremity, provide support, and maintain body alignment. Maybe your patient is a CVA or a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke survivor, and they may have a closed hand or their hand may be making a fist. We can use hand rolls to help prevent contractures, and that could be part of the therapy for your CVA or stroke patient. And this hand roll is designed to prevent dorsiflexion of the wrist. We also can have trapeze bars, side rails, and bed boards. If you go to your textbook on page 284, you're going to see a patient that is using a trapeze. Now, the trapeze can help the patient assist you as they are, are being pulled up in bed. So if you're moving a patient up in bed, you will use a lift sheet or a draw sheet that will prevent friction or shear against the patient's skin. We want at least two people, one on either side of the bed, and we're both going to face the bed and move the patient up using that lift sheet or that draw sheet. We are going to communicate one, two, three, lift, and we're also going to make sure the patient knows uh, what we're doing. If the patient can assist, that's great. If the patient cannot assist, we will have them cross their arms over their chest. So we'll keep their arms on the core of their body, okay? And this is going to be a coordinated movement. We will use very good and clear communication. And the, the intention is that the patient is lifted and moved, not to be dragged. Because if they're dragged, again, that friction and shear can create an issue where they can get skin tears, pressure ulcers, and they can compromise their skin integrity. Log rolling is found in your textbook on page 283, figure 11, eight, uh, 1811. So log rolling, we are turning the patient as a single unit. We need at least two or three people at a minimum depending on the size of the patient. And with log rolling, body alignment is maintained at all times, okay? And we will leave the patient's uh, pillow under their head. So we'll have uh, three people, preferably one at the head of the patient, one in the middle, and then one uh, doing the lower legs, okay? That is log rolling a patient. You may be wondering, what kind of patient would I log roll? A patient that has spinal issues, a patient that has to keep their spine in alignment, okay? So um, this could be a patient who has had surgery on the spine, um, and this patient must avoid twisting. So that is an example of a patient that you will log roll. So here we have a figure that's showing three people log rolling a patient using a lift sheet. What you may notice here as well is that there's pillows placed between the knees of the patient, again, to maintain body alignment. So in this figure, they are not using a lift sheet or a draw sheet, but they're using three individuals and that pillow is still between the knees. So when we think about lifting and transferring your patient, you want to understand that patients may transfer independently or they may require different levels of assistance. In the NCLEX world, we're not short staff. We have as much help as we need. So make sure you get the help. Now, when we get our patients up from a lying position and to a sitting position, we want them to dangle. That means let their legs hang. And that's going to be for a certain period of time because sometimes patients have what we call orthostatic hypotension. That means that they, their blood pressure will drop from lying to sitting to standing. They may feel dizzy. So we want them to get up slowly and sit and dangle their legs. And we're going to say, okay, Mrs. Smith, are you dizzy? Okay, how do you feel? Because of course, if the patient is dizzy, we're not going to get them up. 
right? We're going to uh, dangle them a little bit longer. And then if they continue to be dizzy, it might not be safe for them to get up and get out of bed, okay? So we always dangle a patient at the bedside before transferring to a wheelchair. We're observing for dizziness or nausea. Remember to lock the wheels on the wheelchairs or gurneys before attempting to transfer the patient. Always lock those wheels, okay? Stretchers can be used if the patient is unable to sit in a wheelchair. And the lift equipment, two nurses should be using it to transfer this patient to a wheelchair. If the patient is unsteady, if the patient is weak, or if the patient is heavy, we should use lift equipment. And when we talk about lift equipment, that could be your Hoyer lift, right? That's one of the uh, lifts that we can use to help actually move the patient, okay? So we do not hurt ourselves, okay? So we also need to look when we're lifting and transferring a patient, how much help do you need? Get help whenever possible. In the NFLEX world, we have limitless help, so help is not an issue. Make sure the wheels are locked. Use a transfer device like a draw sheet or a lift sheet and dangle the patient before ambulating and always use the gait belt when ambulating patients. Because if the patient becomes unsteady, they become weak and they say, oh, I can't do it anymore. You can use the gait belt to ease them down to the floor. Okay, that's gonna be important, to ease them down to the floor. Okay, transferring devices consist of draw sheets, pull sheets, or lift sheets. There's also mechanical lifts like the Hoyer lift. Sometimes they have roller boards or slide boards and they have transfer and gait belts. So we want to use all of these safety devices that are available to us. So here's question three. Dr. Tingle called the unit and asked the nurse to put his patient in Fowler's position. Which of the following correctly describes Fowler's position? Place the patient on her back and elevate the head of the bed 30 to 60 degrees. Place the patient on her back and elevate the head of the bed 60 to 90 degrees. Place the patient on her back and place the feet in stirrups. Place the patient in a slide, side lying position. Take a moment to think about what your answer choice is. Well, if you said answer number two, place the patient on her back and elevate the head of the bed 60 to 90 degrees, you are correct. That is the Fowler's position. The first choice, 30 to 60 degrees, is a semi-Fowler's position. The patient being on her back and feet in stirrups, that is the dorsal lithotomy position. And the patient that is side-lying is side-lying or in a lateral position, okay? So for this question, uh, number three, the correct answer was two. Okay, question number four. The Dr. Tingle is now requesting you place his patient in the prone position. Which position best describes the prone position? Place the patient on her back. Place her pa the patient on her back with knees bent. Place the patient on her abdomen. Place the patient on her abdomen with knees tucked in and elbows at a 90 degree angle on the bed. Okay, take a minute to think about it. And if you said answer number three, you are correct. The prone position, the patient is on their abdomen. The patient being on their back is the supine position. If the patient is on their back with their knees bent, that is the dorsal recumbent position. And if the patient is uh, on their abdomen with their knees tucked in and elbows at a 90 degree angle, that is the knee chest position. So for question number four, the correct answer is three. All right, let's look at question five. Which of the following is not a position device? Okay, so pillows, boots, footboards, or blankets. Which of the following is not a position or positioning device? 
what can we use to position the patient and what should we not use rather? So, because this is a negative question. So is it pillows, boots, footboards, or blankets? The correct answer is blankets. Blankets are not position devices to be used for our patients. Pillows can be used to elevate body parts. Boots and footboards are useful to maintain dorsiflexion of the feet and to prevent foot drop. All right, nurses, this is the conclusion of our discussion on chapter 18. Remember to think like a nurse.